Good evening. Welcome, everyone. My name is Paige Johnston, and I'm the Assistant Director of Public Programs here at the GSD. I'd like to begin tonight's program by acknowledging that the Harvard Graduate School of Design is located on the traditional and ancestral lands of the Massachusetts, the original inhabitants of what we now know as Cambridge and Boston. We, the GSD, pay respect to the people of the Massachusetts tribe, past and present, and honor the land itself, which remains sacred to the Massachusetts people. I also want to take a moment to honor and recognize the Harvard University Native American program for their work cultivating the relationships that led to the creation of this acknowledgement. And now I will turn it over to Scott Cohen and the participants for tonight's event. Thank you, Paige. And welcome, everyone. Um, I am so pleased to introduce tonight uh, Li Hu and Huang Wenjing, who I have known, and I, I'm so thrilled to see their practice growing as it is. It will be wonderful to hear from them tonight. They're visiting professors at Xinhua and the Central Academy in China, as many of you will know, and they have offices both in Beijing and in New York, uh, though it has been difficult for them to be in New York. I had hoped they could be, um, but so happy they can be with us tonight anyway. Um, prior to their firm, Li Hu was the partner of Stephen Hull Architects um, and uh, director of Columbia University's studio on Beijing. And Huang was a senior designer and associate at the firm Pay Cobb Freed in New York. Um, some of the major projects they've done, and I think they will share some of them, include the Garden School in Beijing, the Xinhua Ocean Center. There, there are, I, I can't list all of them. There are many very important projects that have really changed paradigmatically in many regards, these types of buildings, which are very difficult, as you all know, uh, to rearrange, reconfigure, rethink in the context of China today. Um, and they have done that really extraordinarily. They have won many awards. Uh, they have authored three really interesting books about their own work. Um, and they've been in many important exhibitions, including, of course, uh, the Biennale, even the very most recent, uh, and the, um, the Chicago Biennale. Um, I have to say something uh, important just for me. It was uh, there are many doors open when you're in China and working there uh, along the way. But really, I, I must say, Li Hu uh, turned the key to the most important door to ever open for me in China. He was the person who brought forward for me this opportunity to uh, be in the competition for the Taiyuan Museum. And I really, I have to tell you, is one of the most wonderful and generous people to have done that. It really meant so much. But watching him in that context was one of the most inspiring to see him in the office of with Stephen Hull was such an inspiration to me. Uh, that was the beginning, you know, in the late zeros, <laughs> the aughts of such an explosive and exciting period in China and what they have done for, uh, moved forward and done uh, with their office really is testament to everything that was happening then and has made such an enormous contribution. So with that, let me welcome both Li Hu and Wen Jing and uh, let's enjoy their lecture. Thank you so much, Scott. Good evening, everyone. I'm Wen Jing, and this is Li Hu. And uh, thank you so much, Scott, for the um, personal and um, passionate uh, introduction of us. And thank you, uh, GSD and Dean and Dean Whiting and Chair Mark Lee for inviting us for this lecture, giving us this opportunity uh, to talk to you all. Um, it's really a pity that we cannot be at the GSD for the lecture this time, uh, at this very special time. It was 
really not long ago that it was a different world. Um, I remember last February um, when Jenna visited GSD and meeting with Dean Sarah and the chair Mark, uh, Mark Lee. But now the world seems to be a place that is so different, is so much more divided, uh, so much more torn apart and become increasingly less and less tolerant of each other's differences. Um, it also has been the longest time we haven't been back to the States. Um, I haven't been actually traveling outside China. So please forgive me if my English appear to be too rusted today. Same here. Um, however, the benefits of less travel uh, did give us more time to think, um, to go back to some of the fundamental questions um, about the architecture and the questions that we raise in our practice today. Can architecture heal? with this truly open and generous quality to welcome all, to bring people together and closer. Or sometimes just offer a place of solitude retreat, even temporarily, a silent moment of meditation in the trusted sanctuary. And we decided to write a new manifesto. Let me share um, the screen here. 10 years after we started open, a little over 10 years, um, which we're gonna share with all of you today, actually for the first time in public uh, in this lecture, we call it an open manifesto. And the world today is a complex system elements. And by the way, uh, this year's Nobel Prize, uh, the physics, right? The, is, um, is the research on complex theory, finding orders in the chaos. Uh, and it's a world of constant interacting and the influx, but the architecture is a vessel that through which we can interpret this uh, increasing complex issues. And it's a means to gather and connect in a meaningful way. Um, we have been patiently in search of that kind of architecture, what we call the open kind of architecture that establish the architecture can establish a intricate relationships between the forces in the confluence. In fact, um, I could say that is a very special um, nature that in the traditional Chinese architecture is never really about the objects alone. It's all about the relationship between the things. That um, connection is the key. The architecture connect us with people, with other people to meet, exchange, an architecture that connect us with nature, an architecture that connect us with ourselves internal. And these connections speak for how we imagine um, above all, the most important ability when you develop and preserve is the ability to imagine to imagine our very human existence among ourselves and the others, the world, and the moments of dialogue we share. Only that, through that, the new knowledge and the friendship can form, new ideas can emerge. So that's why we call today's lecture, we titled that, Imagine. Right. Um, this is, um... Imagine, so as Lee said, this is a very important and um, really important word for us. You know, this is uh, how we can truly free ourselves from the daily chaos and complexity we face as practicing architects. So uh, our plan today uh, is to, to show you through um, six projects of our recent work, um, mostly on cultural, um, most, mostly cultural work, and showing you, um, you know, what we have imagined and what we were lucky actually to have, uh, in, to have realized. And because of time limit, we're not showing you um, the, the paper architectural part of our work, which is also very important to us, part of what we do. In our image, in 
been imagining uh, making changes. And I have to say, uh, we're extremely grateful that we're in an environment that is receptive to change um, at the moment. And we hope, you know, through our effort, we can um, capture some of these um, creative and innovative energy. And um, maybe this, I, I also hope through the, these uh, six projects, you can get a glimpse of the context we work in. A lot of the situation is very different from what we were familiar with when we practice in New York. Right. Um, I think for architects like us, like all of us, um, the work is life. Um, luckily, the work takes us to different places, very different part of the world, um, and to see very different communities, different societies, different part of the society in very much detail. Um, as Munji mentioned, that uh, this works, the only six projects, but you, you're going to see through the six projects, actually the issues we touch upon, which touch on many dimensions of the issues we face, probably commonly and globally in different ways. And I also want to mention, except for some in here, but most of the project here are very, you may seem odd. I, I think we're on the kind of margin of the practice. We're not really representing mainstream, and these do not represent what's really happening here, right? In, in, in any ways, yeah. So um, with the time, then we'll have to jump into the first one I'm gonna talk about. Imagine building that protects nature. Because so often, um, if not in most cases, that the, the very action of building things are often a force that human destroys this world, this planet. But how can we turn this thing around um, in a different way to become a protection? Um, I'm going to quote part of the manifesto. Um, for each project, there's a new beginning that, that need, you need to search for that hidden signs and, and to catch the imperceptible voices. Um, I think it's very important for the architects to be a listener. Um, listening in this case, are listening for those not obvious, they're almost silent um, callings that we must discover with, within each project what's really needed and what's called for and what, what must become. Um, this project, which took three years, um, finished about three years ago, um, is a small, small museum, 600 square meters, 800 yeah. square meters. Yeah, very, very small in China scale. Um, and it's, it's located on the, on the shorelines, um, almost horizontally from Beijing when you hit the ocean um, on this uh, beach site where we luckily have the freedom when the client calling us to make a small museum on the site that we, we were walking. I remember on the very first visit, uh, moving away from some of the buildings until we see this sand dune. Um, by the ocean, which um, we discovered later, not only um, sand dune, uh, beach side, um, ocean sand dunes are rare actually in China. There are not that many in the world. There's a lot in the East Coast of the United States, but in China, there's only three, four locations that you have the sand dunes and they're disappearing. Um, as we walk along the dune, we discover the site where we see really the joy of nature, where you really move away from the, the rapid urbanization and see such a happy donkey as a wow, walk. This must be the place. And, and then we look into the history. It was not long ago. This was the site. It was all natural and the dunes and the wetlands, miles of dunes. But over the years, over the last decades, they disappeared uh, quickly. Um, and if you see that this year was become like this. So what's interesting by um, um, 
we realize um, with the accidental effects when you we we after this project that with a museum that we decided to build into the dune, where in a way you're seeking, you're subconsciously seeking a protection of nature from nature, from nature. and so nature becomes a sanctuary of beauty, and then the beauty becomes a sanctuary of art. Right. Um, and that would create a kind of um, a, a intimate bonding and anchoring to the site. Right. So this, of course, the feature of the site is the ocean and the dune and the sand, which both give us, give us the inspiration. So the very beginning idea of building things into the sand, into the dunes, almost like a kid carving into the sand and into the ocean that you create that kind of um, embracing the nature in, in immensely. Um, some of the first sketches, um, are we very honored that this sketch was now corrected by MoMA, um, but many, many things going through the mind of us, uh, like the ancient settlement, um, you know, um, and of the, well, the earliest discovery of humans for his art on the cave site and um, biological organizations and the cells and the bodies. And, and it's really a, a building that's invisible, almost invisible from the outside, um, contrary to many other museums or manifestations of forms. And we're looking for the kind of but the mysterious quality of the space where you have to this when you decide to carve into the sand and in a way it has some kind of biological connections maybe i was really really interested in biology when i was a kid and here's the floor plans you can see the the different galleries are they're like like little cells and organs that um, push against each other sometimes they they merge together sometimes independent, but this squeezing between them and create this kind of cluster of different galleries. And, and then later on, I realized the artists love to each work have their own space, have their own um, little museum belongs to them. And um, so here are the, the structures um, of the building, which is built out of entirely out of concrete um, shells, which is. Um, happen to be the, the best structural form when you build something under the dune, buried under the sand, also for you know the, the endurance of the weathering of the harsh climate, and then transform into construction site with ingenious work of the contractors. Uh, restoration of the dune ecology. And a year after, amazing how fast nature can come back. Um, so when we decide to build spaces in the dune, naturally you have to punch through to make, um, uh, to bring the light into the space. So light, lighting and the light so connect with the natural light and also penetration horizontally bring views to the ocean are the guiding forces in creating the spaces and, you know, through a year, a couple of years of I'm uh, almost one year of work fine tuning the geometry so that each gallery has its own individual and specific connection to, to the movement of the light. In a way, it's establishing a connection to the cosmos. And so, on top of the dune, on top of the um, nature, all you see is a penetration of the different things coming from underneath. Um, it opens in 2018 in the fall, actually in the late fall. And um, this image just shows you the whole experience of coming through a very silent tunnel through this large um, plexiglass door into another tunnel. Here you see this organ-like model that display on the wall. And the lighting changes of the space um, the, the scale of the space very intimate and also the different kind of lighting guides you through the dark and the bright uh, changing the space and the light. Um, here's me standing underneath one of, the, one of the oculus with no direct sunlight ever, with, but it brought in the mysterious quiet white light. 
and space through another space. You can see the depth of space. Um, some almost like a pantheon of quality of the space. Um, cluster of the cells and different kind of work display in the space. Um, this kind of spiral stair take you through a little dark space, but through the roof onto the roof terrace where you see the ocean. Oh, a nice. perfect place to see the sunrise if you guys up early enough. And on the very top of the stair, you see the, you know, the, the mystic um, ocean. And uh, we are still working on the, uh, the future link of the very special gallery that go into the sea, about 250 meters into the sea, um, working on that through the difficult approval process now. Um, but um, what's really fascinating for us, and what we have learned a lot in the project is the construction process. Uh, not only because um, this is really the first um, building we have done, which is called organic forms, um, um, but also building something on this site um, has been so difficult. But we are lucky enough to have this team of contractor who, with their families uh, in history has been building boats That's for the ocean. Is. So there are fantastic carpenters and um, <laughs> we realize, I mean, there's a lot of um, um, happiness we see on site. Um, and these are, these are the really, really, very rare and to be seen working so happy and they can go home actually every day instead of living on the site yeah so something we couldn't imagine how they built and they did it did it with a joy and uh, of course we saw some struggle to build this form um in this complex geometry it but here a, you can you can winter harsh winter you can see how skillful they are uh, shipbuilders with plywood, um, almost done the, the form work. One thing um, was interesting um, when we work in China is that um, sometimes things are happen they happen unplanned. For instance, we couldn't imagine they would build this form work perfectly, so we did not control how the form works, and of course, probably we couldn't. Um, we were planning to have a plaster, but when we visited the building for the first time on the site, the first time when they took up all the scaffolding and the form works, we were shocked by how beautiful um, and how authentic this, 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 this traces of the labor and you know, the, the wisdom and the struggles that was imprinted on the form of the Congress. We decided to scrap that plaster and just leave this, um, and to leave all these marks of the, the concrete. Um, and they're not perfect, but they're perfect in the sense the irrational into the history, the, you know, the, the process, uh, which is so important. And so if you visit the museum, you're really gonna see how the different things they have tried and, um, and they're testing it in, in this site. The other thing that's really interesting is that this is building is really made by hand, not just the concrete part, but also you know chiseling, the fixing, and the, even the glass curtain walls are made by hand, literally. No, 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 also measurement. <laughs> the measurement are like you know full scale markups and the sending the sinks, custom sinks, and here's me sending the front door with kind of wipe of the clear on the kind of. Um, leave only one trees to clear, but the rest of them the sunblast. And so over the time I have developed my own skill of sending, helping the workers, you know, one day before the opening, um, finish this part. Um, interestingly, the, the, um, the institution, the UCCA who runs the, we decided to take over and run the, this total museum at their first outpost are fantastic in, in adapting to a rather unconventional space. And, and because it's the, it, the, the, the building site was such a, a interesting kind of ecological um, uh, alarm site that um, speaks so much to the vulnerability of the nature. Um, and for the past eight exhibitions, which they did in this museum the last two years, 
almost everything was hinged on this this um, topic yeah. with um, experimental young artist work um, fantastic work here you can see some images we we, we found um, you know different things through the same space how creative they have to adapt to and putting up their own interesting work and um, besides art was also other form of the, the communal um, um, activities happened too, brought in the wider range of um, artistic works in the space. So perhaps um, 50 years down the road where most of the other things, many things disappeared, the doom will still be here because this building in turn, become a sanctuary of nature. Oh, okay. Gosh, I realize the challenge of this kind of uh, the online uh, webinar. I don't know whether you guys can hear us and whether we are talking to anyone or no one. I hope you can hear us. Uh, I'm actually very happy that we're doing this with, uh, I'm doing this with me together. We actually seldom do lecture together. Um, at least I feel like there's some interaction. Okay, so um, with that, I want to uh, move to the next chapter. Imagine museum with no boundaries. So with this chapter, I want to touch upon a little bit of the, uh, the, the condition or the context we operate in China. Um, very much unlike in the US where you would be the designer, the architect would be given a very detailed program, program book at the beginning. A lot of times in China, we found ourselves um, faced with work, with projects, with no clear program, or the situation is very fluid. It changes all the time. And in in this uh, museum with no boundaries, I want to talk a little bit about you know, the, the possibility of shaping new <clears throat> cultural institutions. Because we are working with such fluid and dynamic situations and um, it has its challenges, but it also has the opportunities that you can cast your vision, you can cast the vision and creating something new. And the architecture may once again have the chance of leading changes. So this, uh, on this image you can see the museum mile, uh, which I, I'm sure a lot of you um, as us are very familiar with. And with on the lower, um, part of the image is a mat and upper is a Guggenheim. And these are what we know as museums. And they are established with European tradition and for, hundred, for a couple hundred years. And they're now still cult our cultural icons. Um, but I don't know how often and uh, how many people, normal people in the city would visit them. I do know a lot of tourists who, to, who fly to New York and must go see them. And in China, um, we have very different situation, like in the project I will talk about um, in this chapter, that um, often we don't start with a institution, with a collection, but somehow we start with building. Um, and building something that you don't really know who would be the operator or who would be, or whether it will be, it will have uh, any collections, but you will have a commission to design an art museum. And, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, Please just remind me to go quicker. Okay, I will try my best. Um, so what I wanted to show you in the next page is the, uh, the back of Matt. I, I'm not sure how many people pay attention to it. Uh, what I really wanted to show is uh, actually further down south, 
of this part that it's more of the blank and backside of the mat that um, you know um, basically has much has very little connection with the park. And um, so this is a museum next to the park. And what really fascinates me, and I'm sure Lee is the Central Park. And um, this park, um, to me, to anyone who have lived long enough in uh, New York, is a place that bring a lot of joy. And it's really a place anyone can come, you can be yourself, you can do anything. And um, so this become, somehow become um, tremendously influential to our thinking, the park. So this is another part from, another quote from our um, manifesto. Um, what we wanted to do, um, moving away from the established and expected, away from image making and smooth operations. We begin at the core and carve our way out with imagination. So this project is, uh, it's called Tank Shanghai and it took us about uh, six to seven years to finish. And it's in the city where we are right now in Shanghai. And it's to convert a uh, dilapidated site that used to be an abandoned airport and with, um, uh, with fuel tanks and converting them into a new cultural institution. We started from the very beginning um, when the brief was um, a, a theater complex. Yeah. And then later um, yeah. it became clear to everyone that theaters won't work on the site. And then the program gradually gel to be a art center. And the part of the difficulty is the, um, the site keep on evolving because the uh, heliport next to it, to, um, to the north of the site, and which, which impacted how many tanks we can keep and the configuration of our site. So like I mentioned, this used to be an old airport, but uh, it was abandoned um, or stopped use for many, many years ago. And that was the site next to the Huangpu River with the tanks. So we basically, um, we, tr we transformed that industrial site with almost no grass into a park and an art center at the same time. So I would say this is a simultaneously a museum and a park. And you can see that um, where the museum starts and where it stops, it's very unclear and it's totally intentionally made so. And this park slash art center really brings the, um, the city, connect the city back to the riverfront and brings people to the riverfront. So this is what the, uh, the, the finished project looked like. Um, I'm sure uh, it's, it's hard to see where the architecture is. And what you see is happy people and park and the magnificent uh, oil tanks. So between the old and new, and um, what we had to work with are these giant oil tanks. They're made of thick steel plates. And, um, they, they have very, very special uh, spatial quality, almost pantheon-like, with a teeny hole on the top, and um, the sound will reverberate it, and it seems in infinitely. Um, but with the unknowns, unknown um, structural, um, well, basically the structure engineer um, imposed on us that any new structure cannot touch upon the old structure, the oil tanks, um, which created a big challenge, but also created something, um, uh, an opportunity for us. And we, we also introduced what we call a super surface, um, which is a, um, 
park on the top and continuous pub, uh, open space down below that connect the tanks together. So this is the uh, below the super surface, a more continuous new space and um, free flowing and can be organized for exhibition and also for events. And this, where you see a gap between the super surface and the, the tank on the right side is a gap we left so that the two does not touch. And we create a skylight there so the light uh, gently wash down and uh, illuminate the space and the tank. And we built a series of ramps uh, surrounding the tanks. It's actually following the geometry of the tank foundations. So you see the plates of uh, the guardrails of the ram inside. Um, so the ramp leading you up and down. Transforming the tanks. As I mentioned that when we started the project, we didn't even know who the, the operator of the space would be. So we, um, you know, we, we tried our best to um, bring as much flexibility um, and um, possibility to the space. For the five tanks we have, uh, we transformed them differently um, one, one of the tanks, the tank three, is intentionally left empty, is um, just cleaned up and uh, made to be fireproof and, and improved sound quality. And it's, uh, it's to be used for large installations. And for tank four, we inserted the box for a more traditional type of exhibitions. And tank five, we inserted a rectangular volume to expand the circular shape in order to make it uh, make a bigger space for uh, more complex events. For tank one and tank two, uh, they were made supporting functions. One is a um, restaurant and the other one is a live house with a drum shaped insert. Through the section, you can see what we had imagined at the time. And luckily, when the, the operator came on later in the phase, I think in the interior construction phase of the project, um, what we provided, the variety of space and the flexibility uh, was very welcome. So we didn't have to do uh, any adaptation to it. This is showing in the tank five in the opening exhibition, the team lab had fabulous show here. Also tank five and performance. This is tank four when we inserted a rectangular space for more traditional um, exhibition or art objects. This is tank three, um, to me the most magnific magnificent one. Um, really, we preserved the Pantheon-like feeling, and we ad actually added a rectangular movable skylight on top of it. You cannot see it, um, but that can be that skylight can be open, so this space uh, can be uh, partially um, outdoor, and rain can come in, um, which is what the uh, artist wanted during his first exhibition here. Tank two, interesting. Tank one and tank two uh, is still now is still left raw, um, but we realize that uh, a lot of events are already happening in it, like this fashion show. So different things happening in the tank. This is all tank two. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about how um, people encounter art in all different ways, unconventional ways in this place. So instead of um, being intimidated by a um, high institution um, that a lot of people feel they don't belong, this uh, tank, tank Shanghai actually appealed to most people as a park. So you, you always see um, 
many people meandering through. And you might see what's being exhibited through a run uh, skylight in the grass. You might walk um, to the glass door and see what's inside and being attracted to it. So this is a plaza facing the uh, tank. And there's, on the right side, it's actually one of the um, um, air lens. Yeah, air lens. And I, I realize a lot of people want to take pictures with that. On the left side is what we call shadowless uh, gallery um, hidden in the, in the park. And this is a project space. So also the way you see the city and is framed in the in the uh, different um, in different ways. A museum for everyone. Um, I have admit this is a part that I'm most happily to most happy to see after the project is finished. Everybody enjoying the place and finding themselves, being themselves, kids, elderly. Uh, runners, normal people. And this is showing in the uh, festivities. People line up for exhibitions or just rest. Uh, these are images we got from social media. So uh, people all can become their own artists. Some of the best photographies. Right. So I'm flipping quickly through. And kids drawing in the museum. Um, that's a very important thing for us. Okay. Why we lost our emails? What do you mean? We don't see ourselves. Okay. We're here. Okay, I'm trying to catch up with some time. Um, Next, imagine a park in the theater. Um, to us, it's very important that architecture must be authentic and grounded, not pretentious, not superficial. They need to be simple and relaxed and must protect their own integrity and so that the people inside can also have, can be themselves with dignity. Um, and the architecture need to be modest, which I think is something really, really deeply missing, perhaps, uh, with all the you know over um, capitalism going on these days globally, and consuming minimal resources, minimizing impact on natural surroundings, and you need to encourage generosity, which also shows um, clearly in the, the project when Jing just showed in the tank, and. And that generosity needs to be happening in the mind and in action to include, to protect, to care, and to nurture. Um, so we, um, this is probably one of the rare, more standard kind of government project that we went through a competition that we it took us um, almost parallel to the tank at the same time. Um, but in this project, we're trying to imagine a theater for all and a park inside the theater. So the site is in the in this new district, in the, really on the edge of Shenzhen. Um, used to be just villages, and but quickly turned into industrial site, um, industrial um, developments, and um, happening quickly over the last few years. And here's the the early uh, urban plan, as you can see where the site of the theater is next to the park. It's really meant to be a central point that attracting people to really migrate here in a way and providing all the, the cultural supports uh, for this new town. And we really first step uh, goes into um, looking at um, so many theaters and the phenomenon. The theater has been built in China for the last two decades, that every city are building something. The theater for most architects an opportunity to really show off your acrobatic abilities to do things and uh, you know it become all the crazy forms. Um, but um, and this is the time we um, questions what are the 
fundamental natures of this theater, you know, what true uh, things about the theater. And given um, we have a very special budget, uh, not a luxurious budget, given that budget that uh, it's more important to go um, do something different. Um, now on this corner, you see here's the, 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 the core function of the theater. And then we start to actually converting some of the uh, um, like supporting functions into something else, like the rehearsal halls into a small theater, small uh, black box, which is much, much more flexible, but turning some other training rooms, a rehearsal room into a, a place that can engage the public into a place to it can really in, experience music. So you don't go here to see an opera, kind of afford or not interested, but you can come here to engage your own sense of music. And also the, 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 the red part are the restaurants, the bars and shops that helps to bring revenues, also make the building more active. But most importantly, parks um, going into the building that that in, in, the, in the southern tropical climate, that's really important. And um, parks is a better place that can bring people together. And so you can see how this building are different components are packed into this, this very tight 80 meter square, 24 meter tall um, compacted box. And uh, what we call the, a drama box, which is a quite uh, like the, 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 the Chinese treasure box or what we call the China box that the, the complexity is happening inside, not on the outside. Um, so that uh, when this happened, when the building facade the wrap around with all the active programs, it's no longer just a empty form, but rather the active building with life. As, as you can see, you move around the building and you often see what's happening behind. And being uh, economical, being a compact, it also means consuming less um, materials to build it, also less energy to operate, to run for the sustained life. So the shading provides a very good, um, very important um, uh, protection against the, you know, the heat and also filter the light. Um, of course, then the, the, the main um, part is this um, 1200 seats um, auditorium, which is um, work for the concert and opera as well. Um, this is very special, almost like velvet, like um, a cement board um, in the kind of deep ocean blue, which you brought in the building. And for a long time, we struggled with the, with the government client who doesn't like blue, want yeah. to be red, but we resisted and resisted over the time the government changes, but we stay on, yeah. we stay on and it's still blue. <laughs> so sometimes you're stubborn and persistent enough um, you can try to win this, some of the very important battles. And here are the spaces that open to the public and to experience music, which wraps around the theater. Uh, so there's kind of promenade around the space. Um, the, the urban space are very important that pr provides, you know, I think really the generous uh, space for the people in this new town of Shenzhen, where people orchestrate their own activities um, of different age taking a nap, which is most, most other time in the theaters unimaginable on the plaza of the theater um, and the pond for the summer as well. But what's really important, what is special is that we build a park inside the theater that there's a problem that take you um, on through different spaces. I, this sequence of seas, you can just walk on the streets uh, through the stairs into a, a semi-outdoor theater. And then through some kind of unexpected spaces, gardens, until you arrive on this scene, you probably couldn't imagine on top of the theater. And this is right above the auditorium. And also there's a quiet moment of little tiny, almost chapel-like uh, giant skylights. Um, what's interesting is that one year after the opening of the theater, uh, they had a one day called the, what's called the Circle Day or Theater Day, okay. where where they really understand how this, the, the, the different opportunities that the theater provides, that the things can happen, different kind of form of the performing art can happen in different spaces. Um, inside the theater, this is all actually happening one day inside the, the, the main theaters and the DJ on the, on the terrace was facing the plaza, which also in most of the times are, you know, the, 
um, parents for drinks for during the theater breaks. And on the roof, another thing happened on the roof. Um, um, so you can do a very modest form, but that really provides kind of generosity to the urban life. Right. Do you know how long it takes? Nine minutes. Okay. Uh, imagine, imagine responsibilities have four. Uh, of course, the profession of architects, we carry a lot of responsibilities, but in this um, section, I'm going to talk about school, a typology that I thought very strongly that has so much responsibilities and it's not a type of um, architecture that you just do whatever you want. You have to care about the kids, the teachers, and the impact has this, these human beings like to be lifelong. Mm -hmm. And strangely, we seem to be known in China uh, to be good at designing campuses, schools, but we're, we actually have only done two. And I'm confident to say the one on the left, which we call Garden School, was finished in 2014. I'm mm -hmm. confident to say that uh, this probably brought about this uh, wave of uh, interest in school design in China. And someone told me recently that the Garden School project, the one on the left, gave people um, confidence, both the client and the architects, that school can be interesting architecture, can be interesting architecturally, and can, can have an impact. But for us, uh, you know, we have moved, I'm not gonna talk about the uh, garden school, I'm gonna talk about the, uh, the picture on the right, uh, which is a school we finished two years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we, what we call is uh, school as a village. But the reason I'm showing too is after we did the garden school, we realized a lot of uh, sort of copycats uh, type of school following this typology is really uh, all over the place in China, regardless of the location, regardless of the scale of the school, and which troubled us because you know this is not a one size fit all strategy. That's why when we uh, have to resisted a lot of other uh, requests for campus building, we finally took on a second one. And uh, we wanted very much to break that typology. Uh, we helped to propel and, um, and so in this, in this project, um, School as a Village, we, it took us four years and um, very similar to the site we in the first garden school, it's in the new new urban district, and a city will be built quickly around it. And the campus, a school, is will be the uh, uh, the a big anchor point or energy point of the new district, attracting family and solving their problem of uh, kids going to school in need of good education. So these are, I'm going to flip through our um, studies, and this is uh, early sketches. And here, um, we were really profoundly inspired by the African proverb, it takes a village to raise a kid, um, both metaphoric, uh, both as an analogy and also as a strategy, architecturally. Um, as an analogy, because, you know, raising a kid needs efforts from so many. And also um, for a school, we, this school we're dealing with kids from kindergarten all the way to um, uh, junior high school. So they, a kid may spend like 15 years in, on this campus and we want a campus. They can, uh, we want them to be able to go through different buildings, different environments, feeling their um, surrounding change as they change too. And for us here, the, on the right side is the uh, outdoor elements, the gardens, the fields. Uh, and on the left side is the architecture, the buildings. We break up the building program into smaller, uh, in the, into smaller scale buildings and shuffled and regrouped the architecture, the small, the small buildings and the landscape elements uh, to make a whole campus. So indoor, outdoor are treated almost equally. 
as important as uh, the other. So we get this, uh, what we call village-like uh, more of, um, campus environment. And with kindergarten, um, elementary school, middle school, um, and um, this is the uh, library and theater building, the gym and swimming pool plus dining hall, and the dormitory in the art building in the center, and the uh, laboratory plus the element building here. This is the area photo of the built campus. Um, like I said, uh, this is one of the pictures I really like. The uh, landscape element and the architecture really blend with each other and form a whole ecosystem together. This is a wetland park we designed here. So by the way, we, are, uh, we did the landscape um, design and um, the architecture and the interior as well on this project. So uh, with temperature and tex texture, I meant to talk about the um, variety of building and their different feeling, uh, the diversity we want to bring to this campus. And I'm gonna uh, flip through really quickly here. So this is the, uh, the theater and the, what we call the biblio theater, the theater and the library building. It's a blue wheel shaped, uh, the kids call it blue wheel. Um, odd shaped, triangular shaped um, building. And this is a library inside. So outside this blue rough texture and inside this yellowish warm uh, wood environment and with um, gentle lighting all around and a very bright ambience. Kids love this library. Everybody can find a corner for themselves. And this is a theater. Underneath the library, in the core of the building where there's no lights. Two theaters. Uh, yeah, the two theaters. The, the left one is a big one, the right one is the uh, black box. The, uh, the, the teaching cubes, um, the elementary buildings have the rounded corner, and the uh, junior high uh, school has the uh, faceted facade, but they are all collided with uh, bamboo. Uh, a very warm and, um, and intimate textured material. So this is the biggest building on the site. The, uh, it's a gym on the right hand, and it's the swimming pool here. Both, uh, we try to make this heaviest and biggest building on the campus, the lightest looking, so that it's not so daunting for the kids. And it's floating on the glass box, which is the, the uh, cafeteria for the whole school swimming pool on the left and the gym on the upper right and the dining hall. And on the center of the campus is this um, odd shaped cut, uh, diamond shaped uh, art center. This is our um, laboratory in Edmund building. We kind of, um, we, we combine these two, uh, two programs together and we tell the school that teaching pedagogy is also an experiment. It's, um, it's interesting to be together with the labs. The dormitory building, the kindergarten. So uh, what I mark here, happiness as measurement. I think what's really important, especially in the school, is what kids feel. And every time I went to visit the school after it's built, I see happy faces. I see kids running in the, uh, on mm -hmm. the campus, and which tells me that we did something right. This is on the roof of the theater, outside the library, the swimming pool, on the field, and that is in the dormitory. So uh, one last thing uh, before you jump in is uh, I borrow a Venturi's uh, text, Obligation Towards the Difficult Whole, to work on the campus you know, with such a complex program. Uh, it's really difficult, but I think we have, we have the obligation of making it work. We tried our uh, best to make it diverse, but in the end, it has to function together and a uh, uh, harmonious whole as a campus. And I want to mention that uh, 
as, com as complicated it is, um, it was intensely short time we had to, uh, the schedule we have to uh, beat. Um, actually, initially it was only two years and then last three years in the end. Um, so what I, I want to add one thing that the, one day Stephen Hall sent me a message say, um, said, Lee, how do you do all this? Uh, <laughs> in three years. I know what he meant. It's not the time to say, how do you do one this with a lot of fee? <laughs> so it's a great thing with, I think it's the right strategy for design, but it's a terrible strategy for economics. I know. Because well, when you're asked to do problem. one building, you do 13 buildings. <laughs> anyway, imagine on the dark sea. Um, this is a very important part of the manifesto. The architecture must be radical and yet still deeply poetic. Um, I think we see many uh, radical buildings. We see many, many romantic buildings, but be able to do both, I think is what we need today. That you ask radical questions and um, that can make changes. Um, and but you can't lose the poetry that, you know, the sublime, the mystical, and the experience you can, um, you can, you can only experience, the architecture you can only experience through the touch of your hands and the experience through your body. So we had this very interesting opportunity where invited to do a landmark in the city of Yantai. Uh, Yantai is, is almost on the easternmost corner, almost like the uh, Long Island of the, the States, mm -hmm. um, on, on the sea, again on the sea. Well, we love ocean and we're lucky enough to have always work on ocean site. Yantai, um, actually first time it took us there that we, we discovered such a fantastic history that um, is one of the the uh, places people find the Chinese civilization is not only happening inland as we're known for the farming inland uh, agricultural uh, civilization, but we also had uh, ancient um, sea civilization in this place. We actually early discoveries, um, boats, and, and also the early sun worships. And also um, interesting uh, legend of like the eight uh, immortals crossing the sea. <laughs> So it's a, it's a mysterious land, but look at it today. It's a place with no feature. You don't have no signs of the history in the past, uh, just like any other um, quickly urbanized places in China. Um, but beneath this image, um, when we actually discovered, um, look into the, the cultural facilities um, in the city where the, the wide boundary part is a, is a new district, a new economic development zone. And the other part, the more, little bit blue dots are older city. So in the new city, really, you, you see almost no um, 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 cultural facilities where you can see how bored people are after work. Um, I, I always wonder what people do. So we want to take this opportunity, the commission of a landmark into an opportunity to in turn to create a cultural institution, but in different kind of cultural institutions. Uh, so some of the very early sketches um, start, you can start to see the, that we're thinking about can this landmark has a library and a gallery and a theater in it, that are the three main components. Um, but also being a place we can worship, bring some ancient rituals and and, and cultures that, that actually we share globally, worshiping nature into this place. So really two things happen in this project. On one hand, that is, is the form of the building come from, is really shaped by the sun. Um, <clears throat> that is registered the movement of the sun and it become of the giant sundial and the large instrument. On the other hand, um, there will be theaters and galleries and the libraries on the very top, a place of what we call the phenomenal space, a space of nothingness, a place of in, in, in meditation. And that is not just about the sun in terms of our connection and building as a device that establishes connection to the cosmos. 
is rushes the time, is sculpting the time and, and the sound of nature of the ocean. And also um, the plaza also is, is, is a way to, um, to experience um, through the fountains, other water features, the um, tidal movement, which is very interesting. The, it's a result of the collective movement of the sun and the moon, and the change of the gravity. Um, and really sculpting with the light is also sculpting time. And through that, we, we bring back the rituals, for instance, watching the sunrise in, in, um, in the summer solstice, which is in many uh, civilizations, a very ancient um, um, ceremony. Also um, here, see um, the sunrise. Also seeing the sunset. Um, it become a ceremony seeing the sunset and the, and the winter solstice. Light coming in through a tunnel, a specific tunnel that's just pointing to the falling sun. And also the, where the building is shaped so that the shadow moved on the horizontal line in the, and in the spring and the autumn um, equinox. And, and that become a major water feature. Here you can see how at different times, and through the marks in the golden section on the plaza was made from that um, becoming a time device. So through these ways that, that, that we can bring back the rich one and, 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 and tribute to nature and kind of things we have lost gradually and, and subconsciously through our busy urban life. And here has the building sit on this, um, the plaza by the sea in the winter. Oops and different part of the water feature. That in the summer, this will be a you know, very active plaza um, that was the outdoor, ter uh, the outdoor theaters for performing art. And this set of ramps that, that uh, as a promenade meanders through will be the opportunity to um, introduce a digital exhibition. And um, interestingly, we're working with, um, um, oops, we're working with um, um, Eric Chen, our friend, who's um, now just moved to Holland, um, with this group of students from Tongji and, and future other um, uh, uh, organization into um, the curatorial programs already for the, for the, for the building. And uh, they're probably gonna be called a digital and a phenomenological landmark. Mm -hmm. And space in between the gallery and the library above um, is, a, is a very sublime space to see the ocean. And the library high above is the ocean view, but also has a small little performing space also for poetry reading and a small um, concert. And on the very top, what we call the phenomenal space, um, is really a space for the quiet um, moment of self-reflection. Um, testing through perhaps up to now for us, one of the most difficult, difficult projects to build. And so most lines. construction wise, the most challenging for the contract as well. Through so these different markups and finally going to the real construction and hopefully it will open in two years from now. Yeah. And what well, Wenjing would call a lighthouse <laughs> on the dark sea. <laughs> yeah. But metaphorically also a lighthouse guiding us through Right. Well, I the chaotic saying, times. Imagine under the starry sky and above the dark sea. You know, for all of us living this chaotic, complex life nowadays, uh, as modern human beings, I think that lighthouse to guide our heart uh, is very much needed. What is that message here? You are. I can't see it. No, no, no. Don't worry. Okay. So this is our last chapter. I'm, uh, I'll go through really quickly. Imagine the shape of sound. This is a project we just finished this year, uh, like last, last month. month. And it will be, it's not open to the public yet. It will be open next uh, spring. spring. So the, the shape, the, can sh sound have shape? Uh, it's a fascinating question, right? I mean, everybody knows architecture is frozen music. So this has been uh, you know, a topic uh, interesting to us from the beginning days of architecture, almost the beginning days of architecture. And this is an image, you know, what inside of a uh, violin. And the, these are images of music, people playing music in caves, which are tremendously touching to me, you know, seeing music in the cradle of nature. 
And we feel this is going to to some of the rudimentary fundamental feelings of us as human beings. So Chapel of Sound, uh, I can't imagine trying such a small project. It took us four years as well. And it's a very, very special site. Uh, in a way, this is a special calling. Um, it's not too far away from Beijing. It's right on the border of Beijing. If you see this uh, zigzag line, that's a great wall, the relic of great wall. And the Great Wall separate the, this part of the border between Beijing and Hebei province. And it's a very um, beautiful but barren um, mountain place, um, continuous mountainous um, site um, with almost no resources, very few people living there nowadays, villagers all moved out. And this you can see in the picture where my mouse is moving, it's a, the relic of the Great Wall, and this is the valley. Great Wall, and it's the lapidated state. And what it touches me on the first site visit is in such a place and feels remote and wild that you see an ancient people have come here. They came here and they are builders, they built. So what we have, um, we, we felt the uh, specialness of this place and the calling for something special in a totally uh, natural environment. The, in the very first sketch, this is Lee made the sketch. It, it was imagining a, a rock-like um, volume. The space is hollow, like an instrument, more like an ear. Um, that music can be played inside, or you can stay there um, by yourself. And we studied a lot about how sound would evaporate in uh, chambers. These are the different study models we, we've gone through. It's, it was a very organic process. And the site geology, the formation of rock greatly in, uh, influenced uh, how we decided to build this place, to build this building you know, with uh, how to turn in an organic shape to be constructible structure. So we decided with, we go with this striated uh, form. This is the one of the plaster model we made, it's still in the office. Um, you're seeing this, um, this chapel of sound sitting in the valley section. And this is a, a group of image that we have imagined how this place will be used. Of course, to uh, our client, probably the, the one on the right side and the one in the middle at what he uh, wanted as a performance space. But to us, the one on the left, when, when there's no performance, if you just alone um, to hear, to be, um, to be protected in the space, in nature, and, um, quiet down, calm down, and be able to hear the wonderful symphony of nature is probably more important. Our imagination uh, of this structure in the snow, in the snowy day, and we just have a picture uh, of the first snow uh, happened on the side and looks just about the same. So the construction started as a very small footprint and the building gently landed on the site and uh, it took form. It seems that the building, it just grow with the valley, with the plants. It's during a uh, picture in the uh, fall and in the snow. Before That's a completion. last snow, the last year's picture. This is this year. Uh, I think it was taken, the picture was taken two, uh, two months ago. Um, for this project, I feel like we don't need much explanation. I, I hope actually, if uh, you all have chance to visit someday and to really sense it, walk through and feel it. The entry, so there's a dark, um, what, do, what, what do we call it? Canyon. Canyon and lead you up. 
On the left side is the entry. It's built entirely on one material, except for the, the bra, the bronze. Yeah. The bronze handrails and some of the, uh, the black and stainless steel. So this is the main space. Um, and it's a semi outdoor um, space. So it's all openings. And these openings also serve as the sound absorbing areas uh, for the auditorium. So interestingly, this is a only uh, acoustical space we built without the convention, conventional acoustic material. When sunlight come into the space, looking back at the stage, looking at the sunlight coming through. Now this is one part you can, on the left, seeing into the auditorium, on the left side, seeing, looking at the mountains. And with, with not much details other than the concrete we built, that took a year, one year, almost, right? More than a year. More than a year. Time. The first year was really slow. The first year, I think- No, I mean, just, just for the- metal part. Oh, the metal part. Oh, it doesn't have to be that long. <laughs> so looking from above, and as you can see, this is open to the sky, so rainwater can come in. But when we learned from Pantheon, and we designed a series of drainage system that can quickly drain the water in the space, uh, besides each of the, the seat, the step in the auditori audit auditorium, there's a drain. So the space will never be flooded, and even in the heavy rain, and which we have experienced many already. Yeah. I wanted to start to add one thing that um, part, majority of the building looks brutally concrete, rough, but actually they're very precise. And part of them are very precisely polished and cut. Well, yeah, well, when I come here, sometimes it's just about like uh, my, end, my head, my brain can be totally emptied. I don't have to think about anything. This is our photographer actually in the rain. This is the first snow of Beijing a few days ago. We call it Chapel of Sound. Can you see the English in between the Chinese? Uh, we also designed the signage in this building. The, we don't have many uh, we don't have many shots of the bathroom, but it's entirely made of bronze. And the night can fall. The valley become dark. Okay. So um, this will wrap up our presentation. Um, hopefully, we'll bring this book to. And we haven't talked about this book. So we, the six project we share with you are actually uh, um, uh, contents of this book will be published by Rizzoli hopefully in next spring, in yeah, March it's, or it's, April. It's way for the next spring. So hopefully one day we'll bring uh, this book to GSD, physically next year. Thank you all. Uh, sorry, this is slightly over the schedule. Um, it's, it's been wonderful uh, to uh, see your work. And I have to say there are so many questions many, many people are asking. Um, and um, there's sort of two lines of discussion that have developed. One is focused, it, would, it appears on the schools, the garden school and the school as a village. And, and then everyone has just been stunned, I must say, as I was by the last project. Um, and the last project, it would appear that the commitment to a connection with the environment, with issues of landscape have become so significant. And then you also have expressed that you have tried to work on landscape yourself to, in a way, behave as landscape architects. There, there was a very uh, a very series of questions, one by Rita Wang, about how landscape and architecture as disciplines are connected or not, and the extent to which they might be merging in a new way in your work. Um, Sarah Whiting asked 
how your embrace of these matters to do with nature um, are connected to um, lineages, um, specific and important figures such as Kiesler and the metabolists, which are the figures that have mattered. So I think there's sort of a question about the discipline and the impact of integrating the landscape and also your sources. Oh. I don't know if you want to say a little bit more about that. That's a, that's a huge question. I'm um, so sorry, there's so much. To <laughs> Too but many it's questions. important. Um, I, I do want to, I think this touch upon the topic of the, the specifics of or specialties, of, or, or sorry, different uh, uh, nature of practice in China, at least for us. Um, even during the days, you know, I was working with Stephen, you know, Stephen Hall on those projects, uh, and more so when we have our own independent practice, that we don't have the luxury of what we used to have, all the specialty consultants, you know, you can work with the best Landscape architect, the best lighting designer, the best um, um, every, everything. We're all gone. Now you're on your own. Where your work you have to work with, you can't afford, you know, some of the best in the world that this force you. I'm sorry, this forces you to learn, to get into these issues on your own. So sometimes you do have a landscape architect, but we took on the landscape design ourselves, at least to the schematic design, you know, and, and actually follow up on detail, doing the details and certainly on the construction site. So over the time, you became a landscape architect, but not only through the practice, but it's also for us, <coughs> it's very important from the very beginning that landscapes are part of the design. So in a way, in, in, in our design contract, landscapes always include even the early concepts that we, 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 we begin with landscapes. And also another thing was often in, in, in practice here, there's often the architecture and the interior. But for us, from what we have learned and from what we believe that sometimes the inside happened first. That's why we said in our manifesto, we started from the core and carving the way out. So that's where the space will inhabit. Right. Well, that's more on the practical side, but also I think intrinsically, I think the whole, the world is connected. It's us artificially divided into different disciplines, architecture, landscape, interior. And this divide in China between architecture and interior is a strange thing to us when we first came back, but it, it it existed just as in our education system, we divided physics from chemistry, from biology, but in the real world, they are actually all connected. So I think on the practical side, we are limited by having good consultants. But on the other side, I think everything is interconnected. Uh, your site, your trees and your grass, of course it has to grow with the, uh, the architecture. I find it very hard to separate them. And so I think it's both the nature of things and our own nature that brought the landscape and architecture together for us. But of course, because we lack of training on uh, in the, 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 the certain knowledge of plants. So we need help from specialists. We do learn as much as possible in our daily life, in our practice, but we do need specialists, um, people to help us. But on the design, in the initial of the design, we always <coughs> incorporate everything together. But it's, uh, it's um, well, it's interestingly that uh, as this, I think it's not just landscapes, but also structure, mechanical, where um, without this knowledge, you will be beaten up badly in the practice on the construction side. If you don't know how concrete works, that you will, you, you lose control completely. Um, but I do also want to mention that, um, to um, partially part to come, your, your question come from the interest in landscape. I think that's, I do want to mention that's in inherited part of the design from the very beginning. Sometimes the concerns and the thinkings into landscape or even larger questions, ecological issues are far more important. That in a way, architecture perhaps is just instruments that being part of the landscape 
and maybe it's just a shelter or a shelf or the container of the landscape in many ways that you inhabit landscapes. I wanted to ask you uh, from Ethan Van Staden something very interesting about the two school projects, just as a concluding issue. It's a, going back to that because there was really an interesting point when you became critical as he point, as he wanted to learn more about it. He said he wanted to understand whether you were critical of the garden school and the fact that you know it had been copied uh, it sort of led you to think you should take a different approach or were you arriving to a different attitude i mean it seemed to me that if i may add to his question that your final of the school as the village is is like an urban strategy like multiple works of architecture collected in, in a small city in a way it's a very different idea than the big the single building on the on the topographic the 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 garden school by the way the garden school was such an important project i have looked at it so many times <laughs> uh, yeah, but I, I i you know i almost became a copycatter of it <laughs> but i want to uh, i just want to hear you that was such an interesting moment in your in your uh, your own reflection on those projects you're so known for the garden school um, and that you, yeah, you, you, you mis became your own critic. <laughs> thank you for the question. I was being accused of misleading. Uh, no, actually, uh, it, it's a very interesting question. There's two sides to it. One is uh, we uh, we actually think the difference for the two schools, the different strategy we adopted, was because uh, the condition of the two schools are different. You know, one is the age span of the kids. Garden school is only for high school, for junior high and senior high kids, high school. right? And the uh, the school as a village is for kindergarten to junior high. So mm. the age span is different. Also, the location is different. It's one is in Beijing, has harsh winters. The other one is in Shanghai. The climate is much more mild. Uh -huh. But I think the critical <laughs> part. Oh no, let me take one step back. When we designed the garden uh -huh. school, we also wanted to. Um, to 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 innovate in the school typology, and um, we also at the time we we didn't mind at all. You know, it become a prevailing typology for uh, secondary schools. <laughs> it only become more and more troublesome when we see that people start to copy it mindlessly, because schools in China these years <coughs> become bigger and bigger. Garden school was designed for 36 classes. And nowadays we see school programs asking for 80 classes, 120 classes. So when you have a totally different skill, the game is different. You cannot just copy one typology. It's not one size fit all. And that's probably the biggest thing we want to uh, challenge. You know, mm. you got to come up with different strategies for different sites, different problems you face. Um, well, that I think, Winjing, that that really touched on the key point that so many were looking to understand in your uh, own critique. That was a fascinating moment, and I think it was wonderful then to see how you actually moved so intensely into the inquiries on the landscape. I I am so sorry. I wish we could go on. the The questions are continuing to come in, and. What I hope we can do is share them with you at a later moment because they're really thoughtful and uh, well written. It's 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 a pity we can't uh, share all of them with you right now. But I hope we can engage you, Wenjing and Li Hu, in 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 the future in person. I know we will. I'm optimistic. When you're you'll have to be in your New York office, and then we'll have you. Yeah, you'll just <laughs> thank you. You'll be up on the train in three and a half hours. That's it. So okay, you're gonna have to take that risk of the big of uh, of the big quarantine when you go back to China because it's gonna be well worth it for you to come and be here with us. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. Listen. Sorry, we really run over the time. But we would love to answer all the questions through emails uh, because I don't want to be rude not to ignore those questions. And I, I you know I have to thank everyone to even you know be part of this lecture. Okay, we will save the questions. Um, in fact, I'm going to copy them now and make sure. Um, 
But thank you both so much. Uh, it has been a wonderful evening. The work is beautiful. People were stunned. I mean, at the end of a lecture, people were, I had people texting me about this project. <laughs> anyway. Thank you, Scott. You're so generous. Thank you, everyone thank who you. have listened to this talk. Okay. Good evening. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Bye.